This module is about noise and about strategies for controlling or reducing noise. So on this slide we have a diagram of a very typical recording situation. Um, we have some kind of desired sound source and we're attempting to capture sounds from that sound source with a microphone um, which is connected to a preamplifier and then to an analog to digital converter. These um, last two stages often being combined in an audio interface or field recording device um, or something like that. And at each of the stages of this recording chain, different types and levels of noise or undesired signal are, are added to the signal that we end up capturing. For example, um, as the sound energy from the desired sound source makes its way to the microphone through the air, um, it is joined by all kinds of environmental noise, um, other sound sources, uh, and so on and so forth. And then when we get to the microphone, which is connected to the preamplifier through a mic cable, and the preamplifier is then connected to the analog to digital converter through some circuitry probably inside the device, and through this whole part of the chain we have the possibility for electrical noise, most commonly hiss, but it can also be um, humming type sounds or crackles and pops, etc. And then when the sound is digitized or sampled, when it's measured repeatedly, um, we also have the possibility for some digital noise, which we've seen in another module, um, will depend the, on the bit depth, the, the extent, the, the level, the, ultimately the loudness of that digital noise will depend on the bit depth that we use with higher bit depths leading to a reduced addition of digital noise. So we have um, all throughout this recording chain, we have a bunch of different sources and levels of noise. Uh, and so naturally we have lots of different strategies that we can deploy for reducing this and producing cleaner recordings that are more focused on what we want to have in them rather than things that we don't want to have in them. So let's talk about environmental noise first. And um, what we're going to do now is go through uh, a series of 12 strategies for dealing with noise. And in going through these strategies, the reason why it makes sense to start with environmental noise is that typically environmental noise, things happening in the space where we are recording, is usually the largest source of noise in most recordings. Uh, it's usually present with much, much higher levels than the other types of noise that we might encounter. So really, this is the most important type of noise for us to control if we want to produce clean recordings. And so our first strategy, and it's, it's really a, a very basic but powerful one, is to control the situation in, where we're, in which we're recording. If we're trying to record um, someone speaking and someone else is speaking at the same time, maybe we can ask the other person not to speak at the same time. That's going to make a huge difference. If we're trying to record in a time or place that is noisy, um, and um, we could come back at another time when those noise sources aren't going to be there. I think that would also be an example of controlling the recording situation, and it'll have a big impact um, on, on the final result. When we have noise sources in the environment that we can't remove, I think that's when we're going to move to the next strategy, which is microphone proximity. We've talked in an earlier module about how every time we double the distance between a source and a microphone, the, or between a source and a listener, the energy reaching that microphone or listener from that source goes down by six decibels. So this is a really, really, really powerful tool for controlling environmental noise. By putting microphones much, much, much closer to what we want, um, we will increase the level of that thing, while the level of other things will either stay the same if it's a kind of general environmental ambience, or if it's located in a very specific way, it'll go down as we get further away from it. So microphone proximity 
really the second most powerful strategy for reducing noise in our recordings. And in another recent module, we looked at the fact that we have directional microphones. In other words, microphones like those with cardioid polar patterns that are somewhat less sensitive in particular directions. And that's going to be our third um, of our top three strategies for controlling noise, for dealing with environmental noise um, specifically. When we have sources of noise that are located in specific directions, we can use cardioid microphones or perhaps more esoteric patterns like hypercardioid or shotgun microphones to suppress those noise sources directionally. So having dealt with the strategies for environmental noise, um, we get to electrical noise. So electrical noise, hiss and hum and pops, is not usually as present as environmental noise, but it's usually audible. If we listen really closely, if we listen with really high power levels, um, that kind of thing, it's usually not that hard to find the electrical noise in many recordings. And uh, a consequence of that is that we should accept some level of electrical noise in our recordings because it is hard to escape completely. However, there are strategies we can take that will put electrical noise at a minimum. So we've already talked about strategy number four, which is to use balanced signals when we are sending um, sounds from one place to another. Um, it almost seems a bit strange to think of this as a strategy because it's something we, we just kind of do all the time when we're connecting microphones and other professional audio equipment, but it's a strategy. We use balanced signals and that greatly reduces the presence of electrical noise. Another strategy, and maybe it seems strange to call this a strategy also, our fifth strategy is just to use better equipment. One of the major differences between lower quality and higher quality audio equipment is often in its electrical noise specifications. The more expensive, often higher quality equipment will typically have or will introduce less electrical noise into the signals that passes through that, passes through it. So use better equipment. Uh, and finally, strategy number six, um, our third strategy for dealing with electrical noise is something we probably also already have some practice with, and that is um, the gain structure. In other words, um, when we set an appropriate amount of headroom so that the levels passing through our equipment are high, but not so high that they're um, clipping or are hitting the maximum, um, they're likely to be maximally distant from various sources of electrical noise as well. So when it comes to electrical noise, um, to sum up, we're, we're dealing with something that is often present, is usually at least somewhat audible, and where our strategies for dealing with it um, are, they tend to be things that we just kind of do all the time um, and don't necessarily um, require a lot of thought. And that brings us to digital noise, which is usually um, the least strongly present source of noise in our recordings. Um, Perhaps you'll remember from the module about digital audio and sampling theory that uh, as a rough rule, our digital noise, the noise due to the fact that our measurements are never quite exactly what they should be, um, that, that digital noise goes down by six decibels per bit in the bit depth. So if we're using bit depths like 24 bits, that digital noise is really, really, really far away from the maximum like minus 144 decibels full scale. So this is something that's not very strongly present, um, but we do have some strategies for making sure it stays that way. Strategy, um, the first strategy is just the one we saw on the previous slide. Again, our gain structure, our establishment of headroom. When we have levels that are um, reasonably close to the maximum, but not so close that we're worried about going over, those levels are as far away as they can be from that digital noise floor. Another strategy is, um, and it's, it's something that we kind of do all the time, is that we use high bit depths for um, rendering projects or for recording new files. For example, 24 bits for a bit depth. Uh, and a final strategy that helps us avoid additional digital noise 
is to not make intermediate renders or files whenever possible. Um, so an example of um, what this is talking about avoiding would be something like this. Let's say that we, we have a project and we bring a couple of files into the project and we do something to them, transform those files, and then we render th those um, files out. We render the result of that to a new digital audio file. At that moment, a little bit of extra digital noise is going to be introduced um, around, at, around the level of the bit depth of our new file. So if we're doing this a lot and then we're having multiple generations of that, this digital noise is going to eventually add up to something that's more strongly present. So by not having intermediate files, by doing most of our work in a single digital audio workstation project that we render at the end, we are avoiding adding additional digital noise. That said, I think that um, because digital noise is not usually very strongly present in our recordings, this is admittedly somewhat of a more minor consideration in our projects. So sometimes we have noisy recordings and we have to use them and they've already been made and we don't really have any choice about it. We have to use this recording. And that's where the final set of strategies, what I'm calling here the reparative strategies, come in. What if the damage has already been done, we've got noisy recordings, and we just we really have no choice but using them? Well, here are our strategies. I think strategy number nine would be to edit out the noise if we can. Um, that's going to work um, great if it's applicable to our situation. Strategy number 10 would be to use noise gates and expanders. Um, we may have already explored this in a tutorial in this course. Um, the two techniques, the noise gate and the expander, are closely related. The noise gate is a plug-in that when um, the input level goes below a certain level, it cuts out completely. And so we can kind of set a threshold, um, and then when the levels go above that threshold, we hear something. When the levels are below the threshold, we don't hear something. So this can work okay for sound sources like a voice in a quiet um, room where there's a very clear distinction between, um, between the desired sound and the other things that you don't want. Um, but it might not work as well when it's not as clear-cut a distinction between what you want and what you don't want or when they're closer or more unpredictable in terms of level. And the expander is really just um, a variation on the noise gate. A typical expander has a threshold, and when the levels are below the threshold, they're pushed down even further, but they're not necessarily completely eliminated. Um, so sometimes this makes possible more smooth or more, na or more natural um, results than the really extreme in and out action of the noise gate will, would um, produce. There are some very fancy noise removal plugins um, in, in software um, nowadays, and most of those plugins are what we would call spectral noise removal plugins. Um, what this means is that the the software of the plugin is taking its input signal, its input sound, and it's looking at it as a spectrogram. It's looking at it as a set of frequencies, and then running algorithms on that collection of frequencies to um, sort of figure out what's noise and what's not, and what's what's noise and what's not noise to remove that from the spectrogram before turning it back into um, a plain old audio signal. Now these can work really, really well. Um, the ones that work really well tend to be somewhat expensive commercial software. Um, and they have a key dynamic in them to be aware of, which is that um, as signals get noisier and as it gets more and more difficult to tell apart the noise from the desired signal, Typically, these plugins introduce um, more strongly present artifacts. That is to say, they introduce um, additional sounds or additional qualities of sound in the result that sound kind of artificial and um, speak more to the nature of the plugin and to the nature of the sound processing than they do to either our desired or undesired sounds. Um, so, if we if we use these spectral noise plugins and we and we really ask them to do a lot of work. Um, we're going to have to really listen closely to make sure that we're not making the result sound kind of artificial, to make sure that we're not introducing artifacts um, alongside whatever it is that we're trying to um, keep or remove. 
And a final, um, and perhaps the, this is the least effective strategy of all of our 12 strategies for dealing with noise, um, a final reparative strategy is simply to attempt to mask the noise with other sounds. Um, noise tends to be readily audible when we're listening to just that recording, but if in our final project it's going to be combined um, with other tracks, it's very possible that the sounds from those other tracks are going to mask um, what we might experience to have no uh, as noise. Clearly, this is going to be something that only applies in certain situations and projects and not in many others, and that's why it's ranked as the least important, the least viable strategy for dealing with noise. So in summary, um, we've looked at um, the uh, major sources of noise in a typical recording situation, uh, as well as strategies for dealing with those sources of noise, beginning with environmental noise, which is often most present in recording, uh, continuing to electrical noise, which is um, often present and audible, but not strongly so, uh, continuing on to digital noise, which is always present, but often at levels that are so low that it's um, often not a major concern for us. And then finally, dealing with reparative strategies for dealing with noise um, when it's already in there and we have no choice um, but to work with those recordings.